Hello, everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. We're in 1 Kings chapter 13, and we pick up our study in verse 11. So if you have a Bible, open it up to 1 Kings chapter 13. I'm not going to get into any background or anything. Um, just encourage you to go back and listen to the previous message. They're all on the website, so they're all online, and you can study the whole Bible online with me verse by verse. So we'll just pick it up where we left off. Father, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. So verse 11 says, Now an old prophet dwelt in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the words that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. They also told their father the words which he had spoken to the king. Those words were Jeroboam, God sent me to denounce you and your idolatry. You got the message. And no, I'm not going to come back to your house and stay and eat because God told me I have to head straight home and I have to go back a different way. And so he did. He refused the king's invitation. Okay. Verse 12. And their father said to them, which way did he go? Which way did this prophet of God go? For his sons had seen which way the man of God went who came from Judah. Then he said to his sons, saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey for him and he rode on it. And of course, he's heading out to uh, intercept the man of God. It says in verse 14, he went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. Then he said to him, are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. You know, the best thing that this man of God could have done was just keep riding until he was out of that sinful region. It was a region that was now under the influence of idolatry. Uh, this particular prophet that went and met him obviously was a false prophet who wouldn't speak against sin because if he would have, the king probably would have killed him. And he was alive. And he's living comfortably. And he shouldn't be alive. And he shouldn't be living comfortably. And he wouldn't be if he was speaking the truth. But anyway, this other man of God who came and delivered the message to the king decided to rest. If a person makes themselves comfortable in a sinful environment, they're setting the stage for sin. You better stay away from a sinful environment or an environment that is conducive to committing sin because you're setting yourself up for moral failure. 15. Then he said to him, come home with me and eat bread. And that's the same thing that King Jeroboam said to him. And the same type of person as well. This old prophet was not walking with God. And for that reason, he's being used to tempt the good man to disobey God. He's, Satan is hitting him with the same temptation. Don't go straight home. Don't go home a different way. Come on over to my place. Direct temptation against the word of God. 16. And he said, I cannot return with you, nor go in with you. Neither can I eat bread nor drink water with you in this place. You say, well, why couldn't he do that? I mean, what's wrong with drinking water and eating bread and having a rest? There's nothing inherently wrong with it. But God said, don't do it. So that would make it wrong. And so he goes in verse 17, for I have been told by the word of the Lord. This is what the word says. You shall not eat bread nor drink water there, nor return by going the way you came. That settles the issue, 
God's word said it. It's just like today. When the Bible says something, that settles it. Whether you agree with it or don't. Whether you like it or don't. Whether it makes you feel good or don't. It doesn't matter. The word of God settles it. And so we see from this that God's word and God's instructions were very clear to this man of God. And that's why he was able to recognize a suggestion that did not come from God. Well, wait a minute. I've got God's word on this issue. And what you're saying may sound good, but it contradicts the word of God. So you are wrong. And I know it. And that's the attitude that we have to take concerning the Bible. Read the Bible, study the Bible, believe what the Bible says. And then when somebody comes around and says something contrary to the Bible, you know that they are wrong. 18. He said to him, I too am a prophet as you are. Well, he may have been a prophet at one point, but he certainly wasn't a prophet like this man. Because this man spoke the word of God in the face of persecution, in the face of danger. And this fella here, he just compromised the word of God. So he may have been a prophet, but he wasn't a prophet as he was. And the angel, look what he says though. And the angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord saying, bring him back with you to your house that he may eat bread and drink water. He was lying to him. So he evidently knew that he was telling a lie. Why he would do this, I have no idea other than the fact he wanted this faithful man of God to commit sin. He's a liar. And I suppose now you can understand how he could stomach living near to Jeroboam without ever rebuking him for his idolatry. See, the further a person is from God, the more accepting they are of other people's sins. 19. So he went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. What a fool. He was deceived, but he never should have been deceived because he knew the word of God. He knew the word of God. There's no excuse for this. The problem is he didn't cling to the word of God when a suggestion contrary to God's word was made to him. And that's what we have to do. We have to cling to the word of God. If 99.9% .9 of the people in the word, world are saying something that God says in his word is, is not okay, is okay, then we have to cling to the word of God. Just hang on to it with white knuckles and don't give in to the world. He didn't cling to the word of God. 20. Now it happened as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. And he cried out to the man of God who came from Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord, Because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the commandment which the Lord your God commanded you, because you knew what the word of God said and you disregarded it, because you did that, Verse 22, but you came back, ate bread, and drank water in the place of which the Lord said to you, eat not bring bread and drink no water. So what's his punishment? Your corpse shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. He's going to die. He's going to be executed by God because he disregarded the word of God and willfully, knowingly rejected it. The man who condemned Jeroboam for his sin is now condemned for his sin. See, being used by God to do good does not give someone a free pass to sin against God. It doesn't mean that they are immune to divine wrath. Simply because I proclaim the word of God, that doesn't give me a free pass to sin against God myself. Nothing else. God holds preachers and teachers to a higher standard. 23. So it was, after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk, 
that he saddled the donkey for him, the prophet whom he had brought back. So the man of God did the will of God by speaking to Jeroboam. He did the will of God, and then he did the will of his sinful nature. Consequently, this ride, this ride will be his last ride. 24. When he was gone, a lion met him on the road and killed him, and his corpse was thrown on the road, and the donkey stood by it. The lion also stood by the corpse. Rather unusual. If anyone doubts that this was the wrath of God, they should note that the lion did not eat the man or kill and eat the donkey. That's a strange lion. See, the lion was on a mission from God to punish a sinful prophet. He was not there for supper. The whole thing is screwy, humanly speaking. A lion kills a man and doesn't eat him? He leaves, a, he leaves the man's donkey right next to the man and doesn't kill him and eat him either? It's not how a lion behaves. He was a tool of God. 25. And there men passed by and saw the corpse thrown on the road and the lion standing by the corpse. Then they went and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. Now when the prophet who had brought them brought him back from the way heard it, he said, it is the man of God who was disobedient to the word of the Lord. Yeah, he was disobedient to the word of the Lord. What did you do about it? You're the one who tempted him. And look what he says. Therefore the Lord has delivered him to the lion, which has torn him and killed him according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken to him. This guy is mind-boggling to me. He knew what the Word of God was, and yet he lied to this man of God, and it resulted in his death. And now he sits and he talks about it as if it was no big deal. And he was the one that instigated the problem, the temptation that had resulted in the death of this good man of God. So the old prophet, backslidden prophet, knew that the man's death was punishment. He should also understand that he and everyone else who either worship the idols of that land or refuse to speak out against that idolatry there will also be on God's hit list. See, <laughs> There's a lot of, lot of preachers today who remain silent when it comes to things that God say, says in his word are wrong. They just remain silent. They don't take a stand for it. They're very popular. But they're in trouble with God because God expects people who he has called to proclaim his word to proclaim it. Even when it's extremely unpopular. He expects his men to proclaim it. 27. And he spoke to his son, saying, Saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled it. Then he went and found his corpse thrown on the road, and the donkey and the lion standing by the corpse. The lion had not eaten the corpse, nor torn the donkey. The lion didn't act on his own or he would have had the donkey for lunch and the man for supper. The lion was obeying God. That old backslid prophet knows it. He could tell by looking at it. This wasn't normal. He knew this was God's judgment. 29. And the prophet took up the corpse of the man of God, laid it on the donkey and brought it back. So the old prophet came to the city to mourn and to bury him. Well, no normal lion who wasn't under the control of God would stand by and let a man remove a dead body from his presence either. 
That's not going to happen. Lions like meat, and they're not going to let you take it away from them. Like sticking a sticking your finger in a in a dog's mouth and trying to remove a, move a steak bone. Thirty. Then he laid the corpse in his own tomb. And they mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother, and I don't understand this at all. <laughs> Why is he mourning over this guy who he was responsible for God's judgment falling upon him? It seems like the old prophet maybe was very sorry, but he should have be. He should be. His temptation led to the death of that man of God. And maybe this sort of thing happens a lot. Someone tempts a person into sin, the sinner suffers, and the one who provoked him walks away. And that's what happened here. The guy walked away. Oh, he's going to pay for his sin. But for now, he walks away like he was responsible for the temptation that brought this other fellow down. And then he walks away scot-free. You're not going to get away with it forever. But it sure does look like it right now. Verse 31. So it was after he had buried him that he spoke to his sons saying, When I am dead, then bury me in the tomb where the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. So evidently he felt that the man of God was a better man than he. At least he had the courage to confront King Jeroboam over his idolatry, which this fellow didn't have the guts to do. It won't bring the guy back to life, will it? <laughs> he can grieve all he wants over the death of this man of God who he knew he was right. But it's too late. And that's the problem. God gives us a period of grace. Each one of us has a time of testing to see which way we go, which way we choose to go. And then we make our decision. And then we have to live with it. No amount of crying, no amount of mourning, no amount of grief will change the outcome. Sad. 32, for the saying which he cried out by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the shrines on the high places which are in the cities of Samaria will surely come to pass. It's clear, clear that, that this old prophet knew that the religion Jeroboam was promoting in the land was evil. And he respects the man of God who spoke up against it and may even regret not doing it himself. I don't know. 33. After this event, Jeroboam did not turn from his, his evil way. <laughs> None of this affected Jeroboam enough to cause him to repent. Mo mo momentary fear, I guess he experienced when his hand withered, but he never repented. It says, after this event, Jeroboam did not turn from his evil way, but again he made priests from every class of people for the high places. Whoever wished, he consecrated him, and he became one of the priests of the high places. What a joke. Jeroboam quickly forgot about his paralyzed hand caused by his sin, and graciously healed by God. He quickly returned to his idolatry. And you know, nothing really changes. God speaks to sinners today through his word, some of whom are jolted out of their sin, shocked at the thought of God's wrath, but then after a short time, they go back into it. 34. And this thing was the sin of the house of Jeroboam. 
so as to exterminate and destroy it from the face of the earth. If Jeroboam would have served the Lord, God would have established his kingdom. But as it is, God will eventually cut off the line of his descendants. He could have repented, but he chose his sin instead. People burn in hell because they choose not to repent. They choose sin. Chapter 14. At that time, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, became sick. This Abijah was the son of Jeroboam. And I suppose Jeroboam figured that he would succeed him as king someday. The sickness that Abijah was experiencing was punishment for the idolatry which the king and his family were involved in and promoting. Verse 2. And Jeroboam said to his wife, Please arise and disguise yourself, that they may not recognize you as the wife of Jeroboam. And go to Shiloh. Indeed, Ahijah the prophet is there, who told me that I would be king over this people. Jeroboam asked his wife to make this dangerous 30-mile journey to the prophet. He was the same prophet who years earlier had told Jeroboam that he would be king of the ten northern tribes. So Jeroboam probably thinks that the prophet would not talk to him since he had been promoting idolatry in the land. You know, the worst part of unconfessed sin, like Jeroboam's, is that you can't approach God. He couldn't approach God. He knew he couldn't. He couldn't approach the prophet and have the prophet pray for his son because he was living in willful rebellion. But then he just begs the question, why wouldn't he repent at this point out of concern for his son? So the king knows he's cut off, and yet he still won't repent. That's how ingrained sin can get into a person's soul. Not only the horrible effects on them, but the horrible effects on their loved ones. And it doesn't change them. Three. Also take with you ten loaves, some cakes, jar of honey, and go to him. He will tell you what will become of the child. Just notice, by the way, how Jeroboam did not trust the religious leaders that he put into office himself, that he made priests over his golden calf gods. Why didn't he go to them? Why didn't he ask them to pray to the golden calves? Why didn't he ask them to pray to Almighty God? Because he knew the whole thing was phony. He didn't go to them when he needed help. He went to the true prophet who knew the one true God. When it was crunch time, he wanted a true man of God, not one of the phonies that he ordained for his false religion. He's just playing a game of make-believe. You know what the problem with playing make-believe is? The truth always catches up. Reality always catches up eventually, and you got to deal with it. Nobody escapes reality. No one escapes truth. It eventually catches up. Verse 4, And Jeroboam's wife did so. She arose and went to Shiloh and came to the house of Ahijah. But Ahijah could not see, for his eyes were glazed by reason of his age. Maybe at cataracts, who knows. Both these parents were worried about their son. Both wanted a word from God concerning their son. He wouldn't go, and she disguised herself 
because they knew they weren't right with God. Interesting to me, though, that when life is hanging by a thread, people who have shunned God start looking for God. Some do anyway. Verse 5. Now the Lord had said to Ahijah, Here is the wife of Jeroboam coming to ask you something about her son, for he is sick. (laughs) Thus and thus you shall say to her, for it will be when she comes in, that she will pretend to be another woman. One of the benefits of walking with God is the thrill of communicating with him and having him communicate with you and giving you insights. (laughs) She is disguised, right? Plus the prophet that she's going to is blind, but he's going to know her. Because he's in touch with God. How foolish it is to try to trick God. Man's efforts are so pitiful compared to God's power. People shake their fist in the face of God and say, I will not obey you. I will not believe your word. You will not control me. The babbling, empty boasting of puny man who doesn't stand a chance against his creator and the almighty judge. Verse 6. And so it was when Ahijah heard the sound of her footsteps as she came through the door, he said, Come in, wife of Jeroboam. Why do you pretend to be another person? For I have been sent to you with bad news. Jeroboam did not serve God. But God still is God over him. God raised Jeroboam up and he's going to bring him down. Verse 8. Let's read 7 along with it. Go and tell Jeroboam, thus says the Lord God of Israel, because I exalted you from among the people and made you ruler over my people Israel and tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you, and yet you have not been as my servant David who kept my commandment and who followed me with all of his heart to do only what is right in my eyes. Because of that, because of that, But you have done more evil, verse 9, than all who went before you. For you have gone and made for yourselves other gods and molded image to provoke me to anger and have cast me behind your back because you did that. Solomon made worship centers for all sorts of false gods, and that was bad enough. He sort of set the stage for his son, Rehoboam, and the problems that he had, and certainly made it acceptable to at least consider idolatry, which no doubt had an influence on Jeroboam. So what Solomon did was sort of set the table. It was bad enough, but this character made idols, worshipped them, promoted what he knew to be sin, completely turning his back on God in the process. So what's going to happen to him? We'll find out next time. You want to be a part of this ministry? I sure hope you do. Your prayers and your financial support are greatly appreciated. Our address is Scripture Verse by Verse, Post Office Box, 2211, Wasser, Wisconsin, 54402-2211. That's Scripture Verse by Verse, Post Office Box, 2211, Wasser, Wisconsin, 54402-2211. You can email us at verse by verse no let me let me change that scripture verse by verse at at uh, gmail.com that's scripture verse by verse at gmail.com and please check out the scripture verse by verse verse website if you want to study the word of god if you love the word of god you won't find a better place to study it than the bible verse by verse.com you can study every verse of scripture with me using my audio bible to- commentaries we'll have a good time together if you love the word of god that's a place to be the Bible verse by verse dot com. That's the Bible verse by verse dot com. Till next time, Michael Moret for Scripture verse by verse. 
So long, everyone.